Okay, so the last video we finished looking at the Gestalt principles of grouping. Now we're going to take a look at depth perception. Depth perception is how you know how far away things are, and we do it pretty easily. Um, one of the things we wondered, are you born to see depth, or is this something you learn through experience? Gibson and Walk have developed a test that they used, and it was it's called a visual cliff. So if you can see in the picture here, this glass on top is actually made, so it looks like there's nothing there. So it's like the bottom drops off. It's a cliff. It's not. The baby's not going to get hurt. So they put a baby on one side, and then the mom would rattle a toy and call the baby over to the other side. And we found that, you know, like really new babies, three months, four months old, you know, just be when they just very first learned to crawl, often, you know, up to six months, they would not cross that visual cliff for anything. But after they've been crawling for just a little bit, they develop this idea that now I don't want to fall. So they won't cross it for a million dollars. They just will not cross to get it there. It's just upsetting to them and they think they're going to fall. But really the explanation is maturation that the genes kick in at about the same time they start moving around to give you the depth perception. And we found this when we tested on other animals as well. Um, so, the, you know, it's your your genes interacting again with your environment. It's about also the same time that babies develop a fear of strangers and they start moving around. So it all makes sense. Those of us with, with two good eyes, one of the cues we depend on is a binocular cue, bi meaning two, ocular meaning eye. So you use both eyes for this. Um, you see in the picture, you can try this. If you put your fingers up, you'll notice a little sausage finger in the middle as you look past it and focus on the wall. The reason why is because the image in front of you is going to cast an image on both of your retinas, your left retina and your right retina. And there's retinal disparity. They're in different areas. So what that happens is it comes together to form your image. But when you're doing this, this demonstrates the retinal disparity, which leads to the neuromuscular cue called convergence. So convergence is as something is far away, your eyes are apart, and as it moves closer to you, you move your, your eyes in closer to it. And your brain actually reads how far those muscles move your eyes in, and it tells you how far away something is. Okay. However, we can, we do have depth. People that only have vision in one eye still have depth because there are monocular cues, mono meaning one. First one is relative size. We know that if two objects are the same size and one looks smaller to us, casts a retinal image, it must be farther away because the things in the distance appear to be smaller. Another one is interposition. This picture breaks the rules of interposition. You know that things are in front of you are, are closer if they block the view from what is behind it. That cue is called interposition. Make sure you remember all these monocular cues that there are. Another one is relative clarity. Usually something in the distance has to pass through far more light molecules and usually a haze is kind of created so what our brain has learned is that things that are clearer tend to be closer and if you look at this picture and we clear up the fog here you'll see magically these lights appear to be closer see that again far away closer even though they're the same another one is texture gradient um, the gradients of the texture of, of a building, the coarseness, they will be further apart. It'll be more spread out when you're closer. Um, and so therefore, things that are a little closer together, as far as gradients being tighter, we assume to be in the distance. And that's why we can perceive these little balls of a two-dimensional drawing here, because the gradient gets closer. Think of, you know, standing along a brick wall. The, the bricks at the far end appear to be a lot tighter and closer together, where the ones close to you seem larger and more spread out. Okay, another cue is relative height. Relative height means we're used to seeing objects that are farther away being above objects that are closer. So our brain says things on top must be farther away. So if we look at our diagram here, this looks like a, you know, to most of you ask, what is this? It looks like a... Uh, a black building with a white background or something like that or a block or something this it looks like it's in the foreground this would be the figure this would be the ground but which what happens when we flip it over 
same drawing, but now to a lot of us, it's going to look like a night scene because we assume that because the black on top is farther away and it becomes the ground, the figure is the white. Another one is relative motion. Objects that are closer uh, appear to be going faster. You know, when you think you drive down the highway and you watch those little lines as they go by, they go slow and then all of a sudden they zip by you as they get closer. So your brain knows that something moving slower um, is is farther away than the faster thing, okay? Linear perspective. This is parallel lines, such as railroad tracks. Maybe you remember learning to draw railroad tracks where you, you start them out wide and then you move them into the middle of the paper, much like our, our very large elevator shaft here, or this is the elevator itself. Um, so lines appear to converge in the distance, okay? So the more they converge, the greater the distance away. Light and shadow. Uh, usually objects that are closer is cast more light. Okay, so if it's darker, it's further away. As we can see, this ball is a good um, indication. This light here shows us that this is closer, so therefore this must be in the background and that's how it gets its shape. Now notice these things here. This one looks like we have the light on the top and because we appear that as being closer, this looks like a maybe a, a planet going around a star. And this one more looks like a crater. But follow one of these or the other and we'll flip the image so that the light part's either on the bottom if it was on the top or vice versa and now it looks like the exact same one that used to look like a star or a plant or a moon orbiting a planet now looks like a crater motion perception too as we go towards objects they appear to grow in size okay so when we move to you know closer or farther away uh, the retinal image increases. So with this little picture, this little sun on the road, all we're going to do is make it bigger, but it appears like it becomes closer. And all it does is get bigger because your brain knows if something gets bigger, it's getting closer. Let's try that again. Oh, try one more time. Here we go. Duck. You're okay. Okay, um, when we look at all these things, there's apparent motion is really important to human beings, being able to pick up motion. In fact, you'll see things that are, are moving easier than you'll see things that aren't. Um, one of the things is called the Phi Phenomenon. So Gestalt psychologists will look at the Phi Phenomenon and say, why do I experience this? And what it is, is an illusion where if we have two lights, these represent lights, one flashes and the other one flashes. And if we speed it up, it creates a sensation of movement, sort of like, you know, the school sign scrolls um, or, you know, even movies. It's called a stroboscopic effect when, you know, the, the film frames, which move at, I think, 0.24 seconds, uh, one right after the other are, are really still photos, but it creates apparent motion. And that's how we can enjoy movies. The other thing that's interesting is the objects will will cast a different different retinal image on your eyes but we still see them as being the same because we know when a door is closed like this it forms a rectangular image on our retina and we know it's a rectangle but when it open at different levels it creates a different shape however we still see this as being a rectangular door that is called this is perceptual constancy this is shape constancy size constancy is the idea that stable size perception amid changing size of the stimuli stimuli we still perceive it as being the same size. So therefore we have this little car here and this bigger car. We assume it's the same size. So this car must be farther away because of the relative size. Okay. The size relationship thing is the, if an object is the same size that is 10 meters from you, moves back to 50 meters, it's going to cast a much smaller retinal image. So when we th see things that we assume are farther away, we assume they are bigger than they are. Our brain will perceive it that way. That's why our little monsters here, who are the exact identical size, much like the puppies I showed you in another video, this one appears larger. It casts the exact same retinal image, but there are cues around it suggest that he is farther away. He's up higher, the gradient gets narrower, um, and so we assume that he's farther away, so therefore he must be bigger. It's called the Mueller liar illusion. 
Other things we have, Ames rooms are very cool things. Um, they only work when you look at them from the front, but you can see how this girl looks very tiny, this one looks large, this one now when they switch sides, this one looks tiny, and this one looks large. So what they've done is create cues in here to suggest distance. And in fact, they did do some distance. It's actually designed like this. You can see the floor raises, so we assume this person's farther away. They change the window, they move the, you know, the decor in. The, the, the tiles on the floor are actually different, even though our room perceives it the same. When we look through here, we think it's the same room because our brain has seen so many rooms that this situation will fool our brains. Lightness constancy is also something that changes things. And you may be surprised um, that this square and this square are absolutely identical. They are the same tone, the same shade, everything else. And I know you're not going to believe me, but it is true. And uh, we're going to have to prove that to you in class, which we will do. Here, does that prove it? No, because you think I trick you. But it, they are exactly the same. Look at those again. You can't even make your brain see that. And the reason why is we've introduced shadow. And we'll explain more about that next day in class. Color constancy almost remains. Even though the different light hits our, um, our shirt or whatever it is, and the uh, environment around it, the illumination will change, we still perceive it as the same colors. These are green apples. Despite notice the change how they look, when we change the background, they're still green apples. Okay, so that's color constancy. So what about, you know, restored vision? You know, how do we do this? You know, we've talked about how our eyes send these impulses to the back of our brain and we create this image. A lot of it is based actually on our experience that we have. It matches with the in input. It comes together and your brain creates the image that you see. It's not like a film going back into the back of your brain. It's neural impulses and then your brain creating that image. And that's why a lot of the optical illusions we've seen work. Um, so what we found, though, is people, you know, that were born blind and then they restored their vision later in life, that they don't they didn't see the way we did because they've missed out on a period of getting that information that they can relate it to. And it's often disturbing for them. Um, they have they could see things, uh, but they had things like difficulty dis distinguishing a circle and a triangle. They had difficulty recognizing faces. Um, they could recognize distinct features. They can know noses and mouths, uh, but they had difficulty of actually recognizing faces. So kind of to explain this too, uh, when we deprive kittens of their senses, uh, of sight where we raise these kittens in this barrel, which is very mean, I know, uh, they only, they didn't have exposure to horizontal lines. And when we took them out of this environment, they actually had a lot of difficulty perceiving anything that was horizontal. They'd walk into it like they didn't see it. Um, when it was done vice versa, where the kittens were only exposed to the horizontal lines, it was the same thing with vertical. And the reason why is because their brain didn't get that information in order to make that visual image that actually represents the real world, the physical world out there. What is kind of interesting is though, how do we can adapt to different situations. Um, for example, this guy, these are glasses that actually turn the world upside down and you can see what happens when he tries to shake someone's hand. However, we had somebody actually wear them for a prolonged period of time. And at first, of course, it was very difficult, but eventually they found themselves able to manipulate the physical world with their vision without any problems. Um, however, after the time that their brain had adjusted to that, when they went back to taking the goggles off and seeing the world as they used to right side up, they had to go through that same adjustment period. So you could put on these goggles and change your vision by 30 degrees or whatever, and you would have a lot of difficulty manipulating, you know, throwing a ball at a target or something like that, but you would adapt eventually. Okay, and we're going to leave it there. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is is sound and the other senses. There'll be one more video in this series. Okay, so we'll see you guys in class. Goodbye for now.